This is the hearing for the nomination of District Court Justice Maureen Walsh to the Appeals Court of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts by Governor Baker. I'd like to welcome everyone here today, and I would um, like to first introduce all of the counselors. Counselor DePaulo, Counselor Kennedy, morning. Counselor Duff, Counselor Ionella. Good morning. Councilor Marilyn Devaney, Councilor Bob Jubinville, and Good morning. Councilor Joseph Ferrara. Good morning. And I'm Mary Hurley, and I'm chairing this meeting. Uh, I'd like to welcome everyone here. And at this time, uh, we are going to hear from those who wish, wish to speak in favor of um, the nomination of Maureen Walsh to the um, appeals court. Uh, we're gonna start <clears throat> with, with um, the chief justice of the district court, Justice Paul Dolly. Are you ready, Justice Dolly? He's always ready. Good morning, uh, Councillor Hurley, and good morning to the members of the Governor's Council. Good morning. Uh, it's a privilege for me to be here this morning to testify in support of Judge Maureen Walsh's nomination to. Thank you. Uh, it's my privilege to testify this morning in support of Judge Maureen Walsh's nomination to the Appeals Court. For the past 13 years, I've worked closely with Judge Walsh in the District Court as a co-worker, colleague, and as a friend. I commend uh, the governor, lieutenant governor, and the Judicial Nominating Commission for her appointment to the appeals court. Mm -hmm. uh, and just at the outset, I would like to recognize the Chief Justice of the Appeals Court, the Honorable Mark Green is present. In addition, uh, Judge John Payne, the first justice of the Springfield District Court, and John Gay, the clerk magistrate of Springfield District Court, are all present here today, and I just wanted to note that uh, for the record. In my experience, Judge Walsh possesses superior legal skills, substantial trial experience, a tremendous work ethic, and the highest level of integrity. She's earned the respect of judges and lawyers throughout our system for her competence and professionalism, She's also earned the admiration of her friends and colleagues for her compassion, her kindness, and her decency. Her contributions to the district court have been simply outstanding. In addition to handling as a trial judge thousands of cases, her contributions have extended far beyond the courtroom. She serves as the regional administrative justice for region six, which she oversees the administration of 12 courts in the four Western counties uh, the four counties in Western Massachusetts. She's the first justice in Northampton District Court. She formerly served as the first justice in Holyoke District Court. She is a mentor. She's a member of the District Court Probation Committee and the District Court Administrative Committee. She's also the presiding judge of the EACH program, the Emerging Adult Court of Hope for people ages 18 to 24 in the Springfield District Court. I've witnessed firsthand her handling of these major responsibilities with diligence and intelligence. Throughout her entire career, she has conducted her work in a professional and fair manner, a way that has promoted public trust and confidence in the system. She understands the impact of her decisions, the importance of her duties, knowing the impact that such decisions hold on the communities and the individuals uh, whom appear before her. She's open-minded. She has consistently demonstrated impartiality, listening to many different viewpoints in order to reach a just result. Above all else, I would stress to you that she is extremely fair and honest in her dealings as a trial court judge. I respectfully submit to you that her professional and personal attributes make her an exceptional nominee to the appeals court, she possesses those qualities to serve very effectively on the appeals court. 
I support her nomination. I respectfully ask you to confirm her nomination. And I thank you for allowing me the opportunity to speak here today. Thank you very much, Judge Dolly. Uh, you thank you. Continue to do a great job for um, a great number of years, and uh, we appreciate your service as well. Is there anyone here who has a question for Judge Dolly? I would just have a comment, Madam Chairwoman. I echo your sentiments, uh, Chief. Thank you. Uh, I don't know a person that I ever spoke to where your name was mentioned in a sentence and not with the word great missing from it. Uh, you're a great asset to the trial court. Appreciate your service and I uh, hope you stay with us forever. Thank you. I appreciate those comments. I'm really fortunate to work in a great court with some great colleagues. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chief. Anyone else have a, a question or a comment for Judge Dolly? Councilor Devaney. Thank you. Thank you for coming in person. I like to see someone and look <laughs> them in the eye. <laughs> Thank you for all your service. I'm very proud of, of what you've done and what you're doing. Um, not an easy time to serve in this pandemic, is it? Um, so, um, so you've known, um, you know, Judge Walsh, how many years? I think it's 13 years now. 13 years. So um, what is the one attribute that impresses you the most about her? Her honesty. Her, um, yeah. uh, her, her frankness, her ability to evaluate situations in an honest and fair manning, manner, her ability to listen and to be open-minded and fair-minded. Those are the things that the attributes that stand out to me about uh, Judge Maureen Walsh. Working with her so closely, uh, is there something that comes to mind, something that she presented, something that you could improve in the court or something you needed? Well, um, there's, I can think of a number of things in response to your question, but the one thing I would point out is that for a long period of time, in the district court, Judge Walsh has been a, a point person on matters that relate to probation and recidivism reduction and ideas to develop uh, to avoid people repeatedly coming into the court system. How can we reduce that level of recidivism and improve at the same time improving public safety, but improving people's lives? And Judge Walsh has spent a long time and, and really is a, a point person for our judges and clerk and probation officers to contact uh, with ideas about those. Her participation in the Springfield, uh, the court that I mentioned earlier, that court session is evidence of that uh, in terms of her strong interest in, in uh, helping young people in particular um, stay out of our system in the future. Oh, that that's great. Thank you so much. Your, your testimony means a lot to me. Thank, Thank you, you for coming. Thank you, Council. Anyone else have a question for Judge Dolly? To Jubinville. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Good morning, Judge. Good morning. Uh, I'm so glad that uh, you became a judge. My. Uh, <laughs> my uh, ability to win cases was improved greatly when you and Judge Gaziano became judges. So I appreciate that very much. We, we always enjoyed trying cases with you. We did, Counselor. Yeah. yeah, you guys were great. Uh, is there any move on in foot to close any courts that you know of? Uh, in terms of uh, the district courts? Yeah. Um, I'm not aware of that. And, and um, I would, uh, in fact, everything I know um, and, and I think this sentiment is shared by uh, the leaders of the court system. The community court structure is really important uh, in terms of serving the public. And, and I would, um, and I've, we've discussed this publicly before, uh, I would strongly oppose efforts to reduce the number of district courts because I think they uh, provide valuable services and access to justice for the public in the 62 uh, courts that we we staff now. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not aware of that. There are comment. some, so you might occasionally hear, well, th this court is closed for a period of time. The only way 
ports are, are being closed right now is to increase the repairs to them. So I can think of a couple of courts where uh, DCAM is actively working on repairing uh, systems and windows and roofs. And in some instances, they urge us when that happens uh, to close the court, send the court business elsewhere for several months till they can complete the work. But uh, in terms of any long-term effort, um, I, I am not aware of that at all. Is there any uh, anything uh, brewing about the Quincy District Court? Because that should be torn down. That is an absolute uh, the, the, um, laboratory I, experiment. I think DCAM has been clear that uh, Quincy is a site, uh, a priority site for the courthouse. Um, there's been um, you know public meetings. DCAM is very involved, and I think uh, at this point the planning and design of a new courthouse there. Um, I was out in Pittsfield a couple of weeks ago, and I was told that they're having the court go into a, some sort of a hotel out there. And in Springfield, they're using the uh, the old Eastfield Mall. Yes. And I've heard some figures of millions of dollars being spent on these courts, temporary courts. I can't comment on the cost. Uh, I don't have involvement in that. Uh, but the locations uh, across the state, there are some outside court locations that are being temporarily used for jury trials uh, to maintain uh, social distancing and comply with CDC uh, guidelines in order to allow us to resume jury trials, um, which is obviously crucial for the uh, system to move forward. We need those sites to be able to uh, convene jury trials. Uh, and, and so I do think it's a temporary uh, situation. Uh, certainly our goal is when it when it's healthy for everybody to to resume jury trials in in Springfield District Court, Pittsfield District Court. Uh, that that is the goal. Uh, thank you. Uh, I reiterate what some of my colleagues said. I think you're a great chief and uh, don't retire, will you? <laughs> thank you. I appreciate the. Uh, Compliment. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, yeah, I, have a, I have a comment, Councillor. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chief. I think you've done, uh, or you are doing, an outstanding job. Anytime I have a question, your office has been great. Uh, you have a great staff there, led by uh, Sarah uh, Adamson. She she does a phenomenal job. Uh, you're doing a superb job, and. Uh, I appreciate you coming uh, before the council today. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Appreciate that. Thank you. Anyone else who has a question or comment? Well, thank you, Council. This was starting to turn into the Judge Dolly show, um, but they, uh, there's apparently no more questions or comments. Thank you for coming, Paul. We appreciate it, and um, you're excused. Thank you, Councillor. Next, we'll have Clerk Magistrate of the Northampton District Court, Darren Alston. Good morning. Good morning. We can see you. Uh, he's appearing on Zoom or WebEx, and um, I invite you to proceed. Thank you. Uh, the Honorable Governor's Council, thank you for allowing me to speak today on behalf of Judge Walsh. I have gotten to know Judge Walsh over the, over the year, past several years as, as my role as the clerk magistrate. She currently serves as the Regional Six Administrative Judge and First Justice of the Northampton District Court. I've been most impressed with Judge Walsh over the years because of her work ethic and professionalism. She has an amazing ability to articulate serious and challenging issues, pushing the dialogue to a more reflective and perceptive level, and possesses exceptional insight. Her talents, however, do not end there. Judge Walsh is also a person of unusual energy, constantly working, collaborating with the judges and the clerk magistrates 
on issues and solutions that would best serve the courts in, in this region. Judge Walsh understands that the court serves an important role in the community. She encourages team building approaches and has put forward initiatives that directly impact the community with a more positive approach initiative such as treatment courts for individuals struggling with addictions, veterans courts, and youth programs such as the Emerging Adult Court of Hope. Judge Walsh takes the time to fully listen to all persons that appear before her with patience. It's an exceptional person to ensure that the court runs smoothly, to establish and maintain perspective with all people it serves, and to juggle the constant pressures pre presented every day in the court. I know she will apply law accordingly and give, give full attention to the matters put before her. She would be firm when it is required accommodating with some old respectful law. I don't know her as not only a judge, but my friend. We speak almost daily. And I can always go in her office and share ideas. And she can, and the, she always comes into my office and shares her ideas. I, I am confident that you will be absolutely the appeals call for. And I thank you. For your time and I look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you, Darren. It's good to see you again. It's been a long time. Yeah. Uh, but I very yes. much enjoyed yes. sitting in Northampton when you were up there. Um, at this time, is there any of the counselors who have any questions? All right, hearing none. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I couldn't see you guys. Okay. Uh, that's okay. Devaney. Okay. Um, so, uh, so tell me, how long have you uh, you've been a clerk magistrate? Council, I've been uh, with the Northampton Court going into my uh, this is my tenth year actually. Wow. So, um, what would you, what quality would you, can you think of one quality out of the many for this judge? Uh, what she will bring to the appeals court? Honesty. A quality Quick that you have seen in the years you were her, there. Her, her honesty, I, her honesty, her respect, the way she treats, not only she, the bar, she treats the people within the courts. She always has an open relationship with people in the courts. Um, she comes in, she asks how they're doing. She always meets with uh, just about everyone in the court. She's very approachable. And she is, you know, the the biggest thing is her honesty. Oh, that, that's great. I, I, it's interesting that you and Judge Dolly, your first, your first thought was honesty. And there's anything better than that. So thank you for uh, your coming, for being a witness. I appreciate your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor Jubinville. Thank you. Um, good to see you, Mr. Clerk. I haven't seen you in a while. I haven't been out in Northampton yep. Court in a while. It's one of my favorite courts. How are you doing? It's just, I'm doing well, so, sir. How are you? So, so I have a favor to ask of you. Yes, sir. When you're going to retire, will you let me know? Because I'm going to go after that job. <laughs> Thank I'll, you very much. I'll let you know, <laughs> sir. All right. Th thanks for your support of this nominee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else who has any questions for Kirk Alston? Thank you very much for your testimony, and um, you're free to go. Thank you. Thank you. Lastly, we'll hear from Assistant Clerk, Magistrate of the Northampton District Court, Lucy Moran. Good morning, can everyone hear me? Yes, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. 
Good morning, everyone. As it's been mentioned, my name is Lisa Moran, the Assistant Clerk Magistrate at Northampton District Court. And I'm actually a friend of the Honorable Maureen E. Walsh as well. So I first want to thank everyone for allowing me this opportunity to speak on behalf of Judge Walsh. I've had the honor of working with Judge Walsh at the North Campus District Court for approximately two years now. And during that time, she has clearly demonstrated her ability to actively listen to all defendants that stand before her in an effort to try to figure out why they've made the decisions that they did make, which led to them actually appearing before her. By way of example, it's her participation as a team member and the presiding justice of Springfield District Court's Emerging Adult Court of Hope session, which you all have been hearing about recently. Judge Walsh worked very closely with Hamden County District Attorney Galani and his department, the Springfield District Court's Probation Department, and the local organization to build a team that shared her passion for assisting this state's most vulnerable population, which is the youthful high risk offenders. I was most honored when she asked me to join that team. Following recent research suggesting that the human brain doesn't fully develop until the age of 25, this very unique and first known to the state program was established to change the trajectory of youthful high risk offenders. The emerging adult court of hope, in short, each was then born. Each was carefully and strategically designed to afford Judge Walsh and all team members an opportunity to truly dive into the lives of these high risk youthful offenders and learn what has continued to occur in their lives, hindering their ability to live a positive and productive lifestyle. This is accomplished by having weekly pre-meetings to discuss each participant's individualized service plan, including but not limited to mental health counseling, employment, schooling, and general life skills. The each court session follows right afterward, and this is where the true magic happens in my opinion. I have personally witnessed individuals that were once afraid to be emotionally vulnerable, open up to Judge Walsh and share their trials and tribulations, their stress factors and daily struggles, their interests or lack thereof, and their lifetime goals. This happens because Judge Walsh is a very unique individual herself. She is attentive, she's compassionate, nurturing, and impartial. It is these very qualities that make her relatable to the each participant and allows them to feel safe and secure enough to open up to her, knowing that she truly does have their best interests at heart. When she must be stern and make tough decisions, I've witnessed these exact same individuals show much gratitude for her unconditional support and encouragement. Judge Walsh is a true leader. She is fair and impartial with a massive understanding of the law. She is very approachable and eager to share her knowledge of the thing. It is for all these reasons that I truly support her nomination as Associate Justice of this court, of this state's appeal court. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? Devaney, any questions? Me? No, I, I, I appreciate you coming. And, um, and now, how long have you worked with, um, with the judge? For two years. How many? Two years. Two years. Two years. Yeah. So, um, were you, were you um, an associate before this, or how long have you been working in that position? I've been a trial court employee for a total of 14 years, and I've been assistant clerk magistrate for the North Hampton District Court for two years. And prior to that, I was at Code and Family Court. Okay. So, in your experience, is there something that stands out about this nominee uh, that, um, that you didn't see as clearly with uh, past people that you served with? I hate to sound redundant. No, but that's, that's I'm not a fair question, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but I really, really appreciate and admire Judge Walsh's honesty. I, I think the way that she speaks to everyone and her, her personal background, everything she's gone through in life and her struggles allows her to have a full understanding of why some of these defend defendants come before her. So to me, I would definitely say her honesty is probably very unique in itself. And, and that's not to say that I haven't come across many amazing justices, but there's something very special um, with how she can relate to 
not just the general public, but these most vulnerable people that come before her during the, their most vulnerable time. Thank you. Thank you. Your okay. testimony means a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? Councilor Kennedy? I don't have any questions. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Thank and, you. Um, you're more than welcome to stay on and uh, watch the rest of the proceedings. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Is there anyone else here who wishes to speak in favor of the nominee? Hearing none, I would ask, is there anyone here who wishes to speak in opposition to the nomination of Maureen Walsh? Hearing none, uh, at this time, I would invite the nominee, Justice Walsh, um, to give her presentation and it, maybe before that, introduce the people who are here with you today who are a special part of your lives, your life. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hurley. Here today uh, with me uh, is uh, Chief Green, and to his left is my sister Eileen Walsh from West Roxbury. Uh, to her left is my spouse, Laura Carey. And behind Laura is Chief Paul Dolly of the District Court. And to his right is the First Justice of the Springfield District Court, my friend John Payne. And to his right is the clerk magistrate of the Springfield District Court, John Gay, who today celebrates his 10th year being appointed clerk magistrate on this very day. I want to welcome uh, my good friend, Justice John Payne, and my good friend, John Gay, both of whom I had the pleasure of serving with as a judge. And um, we appreciate all the folks who are here today. Would you now please present your opening? Thank you, Councillor Hurley. I'd like to thank this honorable council for the opportunity to be considered for the position of an associate justice of the Massachusetts Appeals Court. I would like to thank Governor Charlie Baker, Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito, all of the members of the Judicial Nominating Commission, especially retired now, Justice Judd Carhart, Chief Legal Counsel Bob Ross, and Executive Director of the JNC, Lauren Green Petrino, for their professionalism throughout this process. And last but not least, I would like to thank my family. As I indicated, my sister Eileen is here with me, and there are many others due to COVID who are back home and watching it on YouTube. So I can tell you that this process has been a very humbling experience going through this process. And 22 years ago, I sat in this chair as Governor Paul Salucci nominated me for the parole board. Councillor O'Brien was the counselor for the region. Councillor Ionella was there the first time and shortly thereafter, Councillor Devaney joined the Governor's Council. So now years later, to be before you again is somewhat unreal and something I value very much. I believe this is my fifth time before the Governor's Council. My hope is that after careful consideration of my experience and equally important my character, that you will support my nomination to the Appeals Court. I've been extremely fortunate in my life for so many reasons, but the number one reason I am here before you is that I was blessed to be born the youngest of eight children to my parents, John D. and Catherine T. Walsh. My father was a school teacher in Brookline. My mother stayed home with all eight of us with no car. He was a saint. They raised us to have a hard work ethic to get along with others, to be disciplined, to treat everyone with respect, and they always emphasize the value of education. So because of them, I've been able to succeed in many opportunities that I've been given. I've also been extremely fortunate to have met Laura Carey 25 years ago, who, short and sweet, is my whole world. 
So between Laura and my sisters, I have been living and learning in an environment of strong, supportive, and intelligent women. There is, of course, family that you're born to, and then other people of extended family that you meet in your life, and I've been so fortunate to have so many of them. But when I applied to the appeals court almost a year ago, I asked my chief court officer, Franklin Torres, if he would be a reference in my JNC application. He and I have been close since I was appointed a judge in 2008, and we worked together for years in Holyoke. We were lucky to have been able both to land later in the Northampton Courthouse. He as the chief and me as a presiding justice about three years ago, he worked his way up through the ranks as an entry level court officer to an assistant court officer to the chief. And I watched that and supported him throughout. His only request half jokingly when I asked him, he had a big smile on his face. He said, of course, judge, I'll be your reference, but you gotta take me with you. <laughs> so on a beautiful Sunday day, this March 25th, it wasn't supposed to be this warm. And Frankie took out his prized possession, his motorcycle that he was so proud of. He's a loving husband and father of three beautiful children, and he was killed in a motorcycle accident. And so today, at the Holyoke District Court, I have a picture of Frankie, because I promised him that I'd take him wherever I went. So when I graduated law school, I did have the great fortune to work for United States District Court Judge Michael Ponzer, who to this day I still consider a friend and a mentor. As his law clerk, I learned firsthand the importance of legal research, clear and concise writing, and having a high standard for work product. It was early in my legal career I learned to appreciate the importance of creating and crafting an opinion that supports something that is clear, understandable, and just gets it right. So I learned that it's one thing to express your decision verbally. It's quite another thing to write it. In that process of writing, you examine and re-examine your thought process. And when words are put to paper, it clearly shows the weaknesses, the strengths, and the gaps. It's a painstaking process uh, to do this. Writing and rewriting and crafting a decision is something that I've always found both incredibly rewarding and difficult. Still to this day, I remember as a law clerk, the first case I worked on, it had to do with a patent for a refrigerated sofa sectional that you could never leave your couch and you could open it up and put whatever beverages that you chose. And apparently this was a hot seller because there were two patent attorneys, one from New York City and one from uh, Washington, D.C., that argued the complexities of patent law. To me, it didn't matter whether it was a sectional couch and a refrigerated section, it was fascinating to learn all about patent law from some of the experts in the field and then to work on the motion for summary judgment. And that's how it was. Every new case brought with it an opportunity for me to educate myself on a new subject matter and be a better lawyer. And I imagine that in the appeals court, the same thing happens. From there, I was an assistant district attorney for a little less than four years. And I learned the ropes of being a prosecutor in the district court, representing the Commonwealth on all aspects of uh, practice. That taught me to stand on my own two feet and present a compelling argument to the court or to a jury. And I always appreciated the role of a prosecutor, and especially in today's society, to ensure that compliance with all ethical requirements, but also probably the most important lesson I learned was to give people a break when they needed it, to give people a second chance, sometimes is the best form of justice. As several of you know, I had the opportunity to work at the parole board for 10 years of my career, including five as a chairwoman. I gained insight into substance abuse, mental health, and criminal behavior. For years, I've studied criminal behavior and the best ways to reduce recidivism. There, I often voted in panels of three or seven 
In this experience, listening to others' points of view, trying to persuade them of yours, and taking time to be open-minded enough to change your mind when you're convinced by others was a meaningful experience, and again, one that I would hope would be a benefit if appointed to the appeals court. And finally, for the past 12 years, I have served with honor as a justice of the district court for Chief Paul Dolly. I was the presiding justice of Holyoke for eight years and now in Northampton for the past three. I've also served as a regional administrative justice and as you know on committees, including substance abuse and mental health. I've also worked hard to create several specialty courts, including the Western Mass Veterans Treatment Court, the Treatment Court in Northampton, a program called Changing Lives Through Literature, and then my favorite, the Emerging Adult Court of Hope in Springfield. These experiences have shown me that our perspectives and views about what justice is and how we go about delivering justice is an evolving process. I just want to take a very short moment to talk about the Young Adult Court. It does recognize the science of brain development in young people and that the brain continues to develop in a person until their 20s. During that time, young people have a difficult time controlling themselves and even understanding the long-term consequences of their actions. So we deal with the high risk, I call them kids, 18 to 24. It focuses on trauma-related counseling, cognitive behavioral therapy, intensive probation, and then instead of just a job, creating career opportunities for these young men and women. And then to prevent a conviction from being such a lifetime barrier, the district attorney, District Attorney Anthony Galoni is willing to expunge the record upon successful completion of this program. I have to credit District Attorney Galoni in particular, as well as the ROCA organization, Christine Judd and the Springfield probation officers and all the team. DA Galoni hasn't missed a meeting and he fully supports and believe in this court. I'll just highlight one participant, Antonio. Shows great promise. He's striving to be a CDL driver. So we're working with him on some of the foundational blocks, like showing up to work on time and reducing and then eliminating his use of marijuana. So it is the culmination of my past experiences coupled with my years as a trial court judge that I believe will make me a valuable addition to the appeals court. I have sat in the courtroom countless hours and made thousands of decisions, big and small. The district court's jurisdiction, as you know, is so vast and big. And in every district court, you could start your day with a substance abuse or mental health petition and then go on to civil matters and on to criminal matters. My hope is that my common sense approach and experience would add value to the already impressive and talented men and women who sit on the appeals court. My hope is that more district court experience will strengthen an already strong court. I want to thank all of you for your consideration and I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to start with Councilor DePaulo. Do you have any questions? I do. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's a pleasure to have met you in person today. Congratulations on your nomination. Thank you, Council. I just want to touch on a few points that we were able to talk about prior to this hearing and that um, emerge from some of the comments we've heard from your witnesses and from you this morning. So the Emerging Adult Court of Hope uh, is amazing. Uh, the more I looked into it on learning about your nomination. Um, so I wonder if I could ask a little bit about your perspective on that. Do you believe that the age of juvenile jurisdiction should be raised? I think that's a question for the legislature. Uh, I know that um, when it was changed from 17 to 18, uh, it uh, t took some of our cases, but I do believe that opportunities in the district court with 18 to 24 year olds provides an appropriate place uh, to rehabilitate. Mm -hmm. And that's from the perspective of uh, the science on brain development that you spoke of, correct? It is. And we had a chance to talk about a case, um, a recent case decided by the SJC uh, where the underlying issue was a juvenile being held in contempt. Um, and I'm wondering, based on your knowledge of brain development, um, based on your knowledge of trauma-informed care, 
um, how would you use your discretion around a young person, an emerging adult, um, showing signs of uh, lack of impulse control um, or otherwise uh, manifesting behavior that's predictable and perhaps I'm wondering if how you'd use your discretion considering issues such as contempt. So I can say in my 13 years as a judge, I've never held anybody in contempt or even threatened it. Uh, but I will say that part of what I hope to come across is somebody who puts people at ease, whether it's lawyers arguing or somebody uh, in the audience. But Councilor DePaulo, you can see it almost like a volcano starting to erupt and the person squirming in their seat or they're starting to move or just getting twitchy. And sometimes it's just bringing them up to the sidebar and saying, oh, you're having a tough time. Let's take a deep breath and I'm going to get to you. And sometimes it's letting them pace around a little bit, which might not be considered formal in a court, but sometimes will reduce their stress levels. And sometimes with outbursts, it's a teaching moment. So I always say, I address you as sir or ma'am. I expect the same respect and I expect you to treat me the same way I'm treating you. Uh, and I don't want to punish them. I want to try to show them that there's another way to express their frustration. And I'm so happy to hear that uh, perspective and that level of trauma-informed uh, knowledge that you'd bring to this role and you bring to your current role. Um, and I think it's so important. Uh, and just two other questions. We had occasion to talk about racial disparities in our justice system. And I wonder if you could talk about what you think the best way for the judiciary to address it in the in the small role they have to impact this, maybe large role. It definitely is a role. And I would say that it's unbelievable to me that Chief Justice Gantz saw this issue and addressed it head on. What a powerful statement and what a brave thing to do, uh, to look inside of our own organization. And I know as judges, always pride ourselves on trying to be open-minded and fair and impartial, but racial bias exists and exists in probably so many, if not every facet and organization. The district court has done a phenomenal job under the leadership of Chief Justice Dolly and uh, Regional Administrative Justice Stacy Forts to create opportunities, trainings, we have a bench uh, card that I have right there on the bench and some of the very simple things like taking a moment, don't act in judgment, start to look at your own cases and see if there's any pattern of discrimination. Um, and to the very complex things like changing the jury instructions. We used to have jury instructions that would say, you can judge a person and consider the way that they look, they talk, their intelligence or not. It's gone on for years. And now with we have a specific instruction on implicit bias that tells the jurors, I have implicit bias. We all do. And that you need to be aware of it and check it to make decisions that are based on fairness and justice. And as far as it concerns diversity of perspectives in the judiciary, would you commit yourself to mentoring underrepresented groups, in particular women and attorneys of color as they're coming up? Be honored to. Um, I had a great conversation with you prior to this hearing. I think your perspective is exactly what we need in our courts, uh, and I'll be very happy to support you uh, when we vote at our assembly. Thank you, Councillor. It's meaningful to me. Thank you very much. At this time, I'll call on Councillor Kennedy. Councillor Kennedy stepped out for a uh, court hearing. He'll be back shortly. Thank you very much for the information. Councillor Duff. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor Hurley. It's great to Did the judge go. Oh, they showed me Kennedy. How are you doing, Judge Walsh? I'm holding my own. Thank you, Councillor Duff. You, you are holding your own indeed, and I put you through the steps uh, during our very lengthy conversation. <laughs> um, I enjoyed but that. I, I very much enjoyed it, and I very much have enjoyed your writing. Um, 
And as many people know, I talk about writing a lot because I think it's very, very important, particularly as you may be ascending to the appeals court and um, many, many great issues that you'll be uh, sitting on. Um, what do you what do you think has been uh, one of the biggest takeaways um, from being a sitting judge during the pandemic and something that you've learned from it, maybe something that we can take with us to do better or, or employ, whoops, um, <laughs> going forward. I've just been impressed uh, and thankful of the leadership uh, in a very short time. We were only closed for two days. As an organization, we went from always doing things in person uh, to quickly learning that technology can be extremely helpful, not only now during the pandemic, but going forward uh, for the practice of law and for the administration of justice. But I think people really rallied to the cause and they gave even more as public servants. There are people in clerk's offices that work till 6.30 or 7 o'clock at night because things take longer. But I think the commitment of the trial court employees to me has been the most satisfying in this time of the pandemic. That's really yeah. lovely to hear. Um, I do think that uh, one of the silver linings will be the embracing of technology to really uh, implement access to justice in, in ways that we hadn't thought about before. And so there are always, um, you know, it's great when people can be in a place in person, but it it doesn't always work. And it being able to employ the technology, frankly, can help people move the dockets more quickly um, in some cases. And so I, I do think that's something I've heard over and over again. But, but your compliment to the staff in the courts, um, thank you for that, because I do think that their work is under-recognized at times. And, um, you know, people are always very uh, willing and able to throw criticism, but they're not always willing and able to say job well done and thanks for going above and beyond. Um, what do you think will be your biggest challenge going to the appeals court? I think she said Mark Green, but no. <laughs> <laughs> He and I have a truce, so I think that doesn't count. So in my career, Counselor Duff, I have watched giants. I mean, Appeals Court Justice Bono, Appeals Court Justice Kinder, Appeals Court Justice Mead and Nyman. I actually hired Patty Malone, who's an Appeals Court permanent law clerk. Uh, Justice Carhart, I think my biggest challenge will be living up to their standards. Yeah, there are some great minds. There are some really great minds on the appeals court. Um, and and appeals court justice Catherine Hand too, who yeah is unbelievable. Yep, there are some great minds. Uh, we're very lucky in this Commonwealth that that we have that. Um, what do you think has been the most um, challenging issue that you faced as a district court judge? I wish I could do more to help. So you can see people come before you and you try with sometimes in the district court because we have the most volume and whether it's people facing evictions or people suffering from mental health or people engaging in criminal behavior. I think the challenge is every day to do better. Yeah, well, that's one of the things I've heard about you from many, many people. 
um, that you do strive for excellence. And I appreciate that. Um, I'm not going to belabor this conversation because you and I really spoke in, in quite a bit of detail. And I think you have a very good uh, sense of, of where I stand on a lot of these issues and really um, social and economic justice. And I think um, Council DiPaolo uh, echoed um, many of the feelings that I have um, when he said, um, you, you're the type of judge that we need right now. Just the fact that you're talking about implicit bias and the recognition that each of us through, um, you know, just the color of our skin and, and the fact that we have had privilege of, of opportunity and, uh, in my case, education and an intact family, it, it's, it's a gift that, that we've been given just through chance. And, um, you know, I strongly believe that as elected officials, as judges, as, as people uh, in government, that we have to hold ourselves to a higher, higher standard and do better. And I do think that you concur with that thought in your, um, your words, your actions have certainly matched your words. So um, it's, it's a pleasure to, to see your nomination and I'm sure you will do very well. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Duff. Um, I would indicate that I'm going to call on Councillor Kennedy next. However, I'm also told that the Lieutenant Governor will be here momentarily. So, uh, Councillor Kennedy, uh, you may uh, question the nominee, but be prepared to be interrupted. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I apologize. I had to step out. I actually had a scheduled 11:15 trial readiness conference on Suffolk Superior. You know how judges can get uh, a little um, testy when you're not there. I've heard that. You heard that, yeah. Um, but good. anyway, um, it's good to see you. The, uh, put your parole board hat on in a minute. How many years were you on the parole board? Ten. Ten. You do some commutations during that time. A few. And pardons. Many. Mm -hmm. How often would you push pardons through? Very often. And what about commutations? Not so often, but in exceptional circumstances, given the high standard, some. You know how many we've had of pardons and commutations in the last 20 years? I think I know the answer. Almost none. It's kind of sad, isn't it? I think it's complex but it's sad for those people mm. um you, you would agree with me based on your experience on the parole board that um uh, it's something that should be relief that's available to people in, in a meaningful way um uh, you uh, i don't have a lot of questions for you we talked on the phone um and uh uh, I, everything that uh, I've heard about you has been a plus in terms of your performance out both on the parole board and in the uh, district court. I don't fortunately, unfortunately, unfortunately get out to that area very often, occasionally, but not recently. Uh, and I try to avoid it because I'm not really fond of the Mass Pike. Um, and the, it's an all day affair every time I do go out there. You have great witnesses. Your counselor has been a big fan. Um, she uh, worked with you for a while and uh, uh, had uh, many, many good things to say about you. Um, so I'll be voting for you next week. I have, I have no issues with you. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, again, um, I'm waiting for a text to say that the LG is on our way down. So in the meantime, um, Council Ferrara, do you have any questions? I do. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, we also had extensive conversations on the phone. I appreciate um, your indulgence um, to subject yourself to this board again. It's quite remarkable. Congratulations. Um, sorry to hear about your friend, the chief court officer. Uh, I know when I, we spoke a couple of weeks ago, um, he had just passed and it's very sad, very, very sad. Um, and you and I talked about something that's been on my mind uh, recently, and that's about uh, police training. And I want to thank you for your service as a police officer, as an ADA, as someone on the parole board, as a judge. That's incredible, uh, remarkable uh, public service. So, so thank you. And um, I'd like to uh, just pick your brain on a couple of things. And one of the things you and I discussed 
um, was how we train our police officers. Now, in 1985, I went to the police academy, and the state police took over for the first time ever, training local police officers. And uh, it was regimented, and it was hard, and they ran in and tipped over desks and screamed and yelled at you and made you stand at attention and do crazy things to you for 21 weeks. But now it's 36 years later. And um, I know someone that was, uh, and quite honestly, um, you and I discussed it, somebody who attended and was thrown out of the court office academy recently, just uh, within the last two weeks. And I question, and I want to know your feelings about it, on how, and listen, um, I was chief of police for nine years. I was on the executive board of the Mass Chiefs. I was president of the Mass Chiefs Association, overseeing 95 cities and towns. Um, I want to know what your thoughts are on how we train our police officers, how we train our court officers these, these days. Do you think there's a correlation between um, the, the training they're receiving at the academy and how they should perform on the streets? Do you have any thoughts about that since you've been in law enforcement and judiciary system for your entire life? Thank you, Councillor Ferrer. I also have uh, the distinct honor. My sister Marianne was one of the first female state troopers, and uh, my spouse, Laura Carey. Uh, retired two years ago from the Massachusetts State Police. Thank you for your service, Trooper. And I think training is essential, and I think it does correlate to how a person knows how to act. I think they need to be trained in restraints because at times they are our first line of defense, right? Uh, mm -hmm. But it has to be done in a way that is respectful, uh, that treats everyone fairly, and treats people with dignity. Do you think, um, and stories I've heard as of late, assault of behavior on the recruits, um, demeaning, berating, um, going to their cars at five o'clock at night only to be put through two more hours of calisthenics, getting on all fours, crawling across parking lots, getting screamed at. Do you think that correlates into making a good court officer? Respectfully, Councillor, for, in my opinion, does not. You know anything about the qualifications of the people that design these programs or the people that oversee these programs? I can't uh, profess that I'm familiar with the trial court's uh, requirements for mm -hmm. qualifications and uh, experience to train the incoming court officers. Have you heard complaints about the training of court officers or police officers? I have heard some complaints recently. You, um, are you aware of any investigations um, going into the training of these court officers or police officers? And I'm not trying to deflect uh, the answer, Council Ferrer, but it, the trial court security uh, is separate and distinct from my role. And so I, I would not be made aware, even if there was an investigation happening. Excuse think me. It's incumbent upon the trial court to uh, do investigations when they come to learn of these allegations? Absolutely, yeah. it's part of our responsibility. I know I don't when I was mean, chief, uh, drilled, in, drilled into uh, my skull was, uh, what did you know? When did you know it? What did you do about it? And uh, if there is such an investigation, you think that should be open to the public? Absolutely, we need transparency. I'm sorry, was someone uh, trying to excuse me? me? Yes. Um, I know you're on a roll, Councilor Ferrara, but the Lieutenant Governor is coming in. Um, I'll be glad to continue later, thank you. Yes, Children. that's that's fine. Judge Wallace, you. you can stay where you are or you can move about the chamber, but I suggest you don't leave because this will probably be a short um, assembly, but we have to have Lieutenant it. Lieutenant Governor is walking in right now. Lieutenant Governor is walking in. Welcome, Lieutenant Governor. It is still morning. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Councillor Hurley, Councillor Duff. Hello. Good morning. This uh, is our assembly. We're calling it to order, and I recognize Councillor Ferreira for our prayer and pledge today. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor. I would just uh, like a moment of silence and a prayer for those in a position of authority in government and in the private sector to address the atrocities that we've seen throughout the world recently uh, regarding COVID and pray that uh, everyone in a position of power can do the best they can do to help address this uh, worldwide tragedy. Thank you. Pledge allegiance 
to the flag. Flag the of the United States of America. America. To the Republic. And to the Republic. Just stands. For which it one stands. One nation under God. Under God. Indivisible. Indivisible. With liberty, with liberty and justice, and justice for all. For all. Thank you all very much for your time today. I do see uh, Chief Justice Green and Chief Dolly. I know I don't recognize everyone with your face covering, Tom. Thank you for being here. Uh, Judge Payne, Magistrate Gay, thank you very much for coming in today and for being part of this process. I would like to recognize Councilor Devaney for a motion to record advice and consent for the financial warrant. Second. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor say aye. 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 I recognize Councillor Jupinville for a motion to record advice and consent for the pending list of notaries, public, and justices of the peace. So moved. Second. Okay. There's a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. And I recognize Councillor DePaulo for a motion to record advice and consent for the appointment of Courtney Price to the position of clerk magistrate of the Lamonster District Court. Thank you. This is an outstanding nominee, and I happily offer that motion. Second. Good. Discussion? Yes. This is Green. the nominee. Um, in my 21 years, I, I, I was very impressed with this nominee. Um, and I will not vote for someone 40 years old. But there are exceptions, and she is the one exception on the rule. And I, I think that she brings... Um, life experience to the um, to the bench that other people with more years than she has doesn't have. So I, I think she's going to be um, a wonderful uh, person on on the bench. I think that she has the compassion and the empathy that I look for, and uh, she brings experience that I look for too. Thank you. Okay. We may begin the roll call. Councilor Kennedy? Yes. Councilor DiPaolo? Yes. Councilor Hurley? Yes. Yes. Councilor Ferreira? Yes. Councilor Jubinville? I give my advice and consent. Councilor Devini? Yes. Councilor Ionella? Yes. Councilor Duff? Yes. Go, Governor. Thank you all very much. We have a new nom nomination today. Honor Siegel has been nominated to the position of Associate Justice of the District Court. Council Ionella? This yes, is I will uh, speak with the nominee today and we will uh, schedule it uh, as soon as I uh, have that conversation with the nominee. Okay. That's great. Thank you very much for scheduling the date and time. Uh, I want to conclude by thanking Councilor Ferreira for his prayer. Uh, regarding the COVID and the pandemic. And I want to invite all of you to join us in encouraging people to become vaccinated. Uh, it's safe and it's a way that you can protect yourself and family. And it's a way also that we can move forward into the new normal and get back to the joys of what we love so much about our community, our Commonwealth and our lives. So. Thank you for your continued efforts uh, here in the Commonwealth as we lead the way for vaccine uh, rollout. Lieutenant Governor. Rollout. Lieutenant Governor. Yes, Councilor Devaney. Um, there are a lot of injustices, and I can't cite them all. But I have written letters to you, to the governor, to uh, his council, and uh, get no reply. I have mentioned it here, and I'm going to continue. I don't know this woman. But I've heard such wonderful things about her, her character, her caring, her compassion. And she has been the worked in the clerk magistrate's office in air for 14 years. And she's been the acting clerk magistrate. So when the clerk magistrate left this past year, she applied. Everyone was so happy. They called me, they told me what a wonderful person she was. And guess what? She got a letter, you are not getting an interview. I wanna know why. There's a lot of others that I could bring up, but that one is the most egregious. And I will keep asking until I get an answer because you know why? There is no answer. Councilor Devaney, there was a reply July 7th, 2020 and a further reply 
enclosing that letter and a letter addressed to you May 4th of 2021. And Attorney Ross is available to answer any of your uh, questions. I'd like to make a correction. I got one letter from Mr. Dacia, very sarcastic, was two sentences. You have to see the attorney for the governor. You know, it's very easy to be disrespected in this position. Where do I go? Where do I go? Thank you. That concludes our business today. I want to thank you all for your continued hard work and your efforts. Be safe, be healthy, and help us get others vaccinated. Thank you. That concludes our business. Thank you, Lieutenant Governor, you. for all your efforts. All right. We're going to return to the hearing. I'd invite Justice Walsh to take her seat again. Or actually, it's a quarter of 12. Why don't we take a five minute break? Let everybody have a, a stretch. We'll come back into session at 11. 55. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Will all remaining counselors on the line please hold for a break? Please do not leave the call. Thank you.
And what's going to make the PPR work today? Is there anything going on with your back? Well, so you can still apply for a disability payment on the topic, but it's probably going to be a lot easier to do. If you don't specialize in mental health issues, it, are you doing treatment on your back right now? Is it going to be primarily a mental health issue? So it sounds so that your knee is causing your surgery on the floor. You need to like discuss a possible surgery or schedule something. What's the diagnosis for your spine? Well, I'll try to keep it really simple. Um, are you on any pain medication currently? When was the last time they gave you pain meds? All right, we're going to start again. If everybody could take their seats, please. And that was the most recent back procedure. Have you done any treatment leading up to this visit? Hello. In the last six, within the last like six months. Last year. Hello. When we last employed, Adam. <laughs> He's a good man. All right. Is he gone? Counselor Ferrara. How long are you working for? Are you working for this job? We can hear you, Counselor. They're coming in shortly. Okay. Thank you. All right, I'm going to go uh, around the troops. I'll be right back. 2015, you say? What did he say? He's going to go corral everyone to get seated. Oh, thank you. Why did you stay out of work between 2015 and 2020? Uh, surgeries besides those stimulators.
Would all count remaining counselors in the chamber please take their seats? Thank you. All right. Is Dominique Walsh back? back? I'd like to call the meeting back to order, please. Adam, can you put some cameras on? Hello, Councillor Walsh. Justice Walsh. Would all remaining counselors in the chamber please take their seats? We'll be beginning shortly. We're going to be beginning right now. Councillor Ferreira, are you ready? Councillor Ferreira, are you ready? Councillor Duff, good to see you again. Ready? It's always good to see you, Councillor. It's good to be seen these days. I know, and I saw the little puppy. Yes. I want to Hilly, we're, gonna, we're gonna need you to be physically okay. present to take control of this this crowd sometime. Like I can't well, get him to sit why, down. That's why I, have, why I have you as sergeant of arms. Come All right, thank Mary you. And I will, Mary and I are gonna Terry. be there, and you guys aren't gonna know what hit you. Terry, Bob, Marilyn, the cheer woman is calling us to order. You may be again. You're questioning. Yeah, yeah. All right, so uh, we're going back to uh, where we left off, and I only have a few other questions. And uh, we're talking, we're talking about um, how they run court officer academies and police academies. And uh, you know, my question, I guess, is at the end of the day, if a person, if a person wants to uh, be a court officer, or a person wants to be a police officer. Should they have to subject themselves to this disdain and belittlement and uh, this rigorous things that they do to them, and sometimes assaultive things? Um, does a person give up their constitutional rights? Do do they can they agree to be subjected to this? Do they have to agree to be subjected to this in order to get these public jobs? Counselor, I believe that everybody should be treated with dignity and respect. How do we protect those who just graduated? Let's say there's an investigation. People are reluctant. They're on probation for the first nine months or a year. They're reluctant to tell the truth because they don't want to lose their 30 year career with the court system. How do we protect those people to tell them you tell the truth and you're not going to be retaliated against? How do we do that? I think we need leaders to stand up. Speak out against those types of acts. And to make sure that they know that they tell the truth, that they'll be protected and that they'll be uh, treated fairly. Do you think that the way these academies are run could violate someone's Massachusetts or federal constitutional rights as a as a cadet? I have never witnessed the court officer academy, but I know firsthand when I was a law clerk to Judge Ponzer. Uh, there were quite a few recruits who filed a federal lawsuit for such things as failing to give them water, and one ended up having a severe kidney 
infection and almost lost his life. And there were many constitutional challenges. Do you think um, that the um, the trial court academy is um, subject to the hazing statute? The anti hazing, so I, I believe that that they would be required not to participate in any type of hazing. What could be construed as hazing? Thank you. Um, I. I uh, really appreciate your honesty and your answers to my questions um, regarding this today. I think you have a phenomenal resume. Um, Councillor Hurley early on told me I better vote for you, otherwise you'll never talk to me again. Um, and uh, Neil Shering uh, from the Housing Court down in Baratton called me yesterday and said, what a wonderful person you are, what a great mentor you were back, back in the day, as they say. And uh, he, he truly thinks you're going to be a great uh, appeals court judge. Um, you certainly have my support next week, and I know you're going to do great things. So thank you for, uh, again, your uh, lifetime of public service. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Madam There's Chair. There's no way I'd ever stop talking to Councillor Ferreira, for the record. <laughs> um, Councillor Jubinville, do you have any questions, sir? Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, let me just tell you that, you know, I'm, I've met you many, many times and um, I think you did a wonderful job as a judge and are still doing a wonderful job. You did wonderful for the city of Hoyoke, my hometown. Uh, people speak uh, to me of you out there. You did a lot of good for people in that city. So I'm going to vote for you. That's not an issue. I'm going to tell you that I usually don't say that up front, but I'm going to say it to you because I think you're more than qualified. I do have some questions for you, though. You mentioned the uh, race, uh, racism issue and Judge Gantz, uh, the Harvard re report. <clears throat> Let me just um, read a couple of brief things for you and ask you to comment. According to, this is from the report, according to 2016 data from the Massachusetts Sentencing Commission, 655 of every 100,000 black people in Massachusetts are in prison. Um, 82 of its white sit uh, of 100,000 out of 100,000 white people. Those are really, really divergent figures. How, how can it be 82 out of 100,000 white people and 655 people out of 100,000 for blacks? Oh, the commission, the commission studied everything from poverty, education, two parent homes, international shortages, uh, all kinds of issues to try and come up with an answer to this difference. The answer they came up with was one word, racism. No other reason but racism. And they said it was always racism. And in my view, it's still racism today. You have, have, well, it's racism. So the question is how, how it changes, how does the court change? My view is that racism seeped in over 100, 200 years into our court system. It's in the fiber of our court system in, in a lot of other institutions. So the question is, how do you stop that? Or is there an answer to stop it? Change it. Councilor Juvenville, I wish I had the answer. Well, here's one thought. All of those people that are incarcerated, 
got there because a judge sent them there. They didn't get there for any other reason. So does that tell us that judges in Massachusetts are racist? Respectfully, no. Then how do we have this discrepancy? So complicated, and I don't pretend to know the answers. I know we don't control the front door. So who police decide to arrest, to give breaks to, to not give breaks to, has an effect upon who we see, which we can't control. The legislature, in making certain offenses punishable by mandatory minimum sentences or otherwise, has an effect on our ability. I'm not saying that we're without responsibility to this public health issue. We are. But I think that part of what we need to do is what I promised Councillor DePaulo and what I've been striving to do for quite a long time is to increase the diversity. And I know the trial court has made great efforts to increase the diversity so that it represents the community. I think that would make a step and be a major step in the right direction. And I also think that we need to have some very hard and difficult conversations about the issue of race. And we need to take a good, hard look at ourselves. And even if we're intentionally believing that we're, we're doing everything according to the law, I think we need to look at the results. The results, those numbers tell a story. I think we need to change his story. Let me just read you a little bit more of him. What they found is the criminal justice system is unequal on every level. Cops in the state are more likely to stop black drivers. Police are more likely to search or investigate black residents. Law enforcement agents charge black suspects with infractions that carry worse penalties. Prosecutors are less likely to offer black suspects plea bargains or pretrial interventions. Judges sentence black defendants to longer terms in prison. And get this, the average white felon in Massachusetts Department of Corrections has committed more severe crime than the average black inmate. It's not that black people are criminals, it's that cops think black people are criminals. Black suspects don't get bail. The average bail is slightly higher in cases involving black defendants. Furthermore, more black and Latinx defendants are detained without bail as compared to white defendants. Black people are charged with higher offenses. But curiously, when they get to court, black defendants are convicted of charges roughly equal in seriousness to their white counterparts, despite facing more serious initial charges. There are actually two separate systems. Study notes that prosecutors are more likely to exercise their discretion to send black and Latinx people to superior court where the available sentences are longer <clears throat> and separate sentences. If you're black and you're charged with crimes carrying a minimum, uh, mandatory minimum, you are substantially more likely, substantially more likely to be incarcerated and receive longer sentences. Especially if they find drugs or guns on you Black and Latinx people charged with drug offenses and weapons offenses are more likely to be incarcerated and receive longer incarceration sentences than white people charged with similar offenses. The average black person sentence is 168 days longer than a sentence for a white person.
So if we know that it's somewhat having to do with policing, why aren't our judges more keen on that? Why aren't they looking at that differently than they normally would? Well, again, I would respectfully disagree. I think the majority of judges are very aware, not only of the study, but of the national issue of racism in our communities. I think we have our work cut out for us, Councillor, but I think we're making honest efforts. And I think that uh, we need to have these conversations and we need to change our policies to reflect inequities. And I am committed to that. I know you are, and I don't mean to speak to you as the person doing this, because you're not that way at all, as far as I'm concerned. But I, I don't see, I go to a lot of courts all over the Commonwealth, and I don't see a lot of change in some of these issues that were raised by this study. I don't know, I, I, I think there is, man, is there mandatory uh, programs that judges have to go to? I can speak for the district court and on a yearly basis, we're educated uh, and on um, the issues of racism. I know that the trial court has a another uh, very important committee, uh, but it's uh, constantly something that we talk about, that we learn from others, <clears throat> and that we try to make adjustments and improvements, but we have a long way to go. So, you know, when you're, when you're in court as a judge or a lawyer or a DA, as a defendant there, and you ask to see his record, and the judge wants to see his record, I want to see it. And that's been going on since 43 years I've been a lawyer, and when I even was on a on state police, the same thing. But I, I start thinking differently about it recently and reading these reports. I ask myself, why do we do that? Why do we look at somebody's record? I, I was told by many people, judges and other people through this system over the years that once somebody has been found guilty and given a sentence, and they perform that sentence, they've paid their debt to society. But that's not true in our court system. You keep paying for it if you keep getting charged. Because when you look at a record, you sentence somebody, most people sentence somebody to a higher sentence than somebody with no record, right? And I argue that too to judges, but my, my thoughts are that maybe that's, that's racist. And I'll tell you why I think that. Because when I represent people of color and minorities, they usually have more on their record than white people. So if, this study is correct, police are charging and arresting minorities greater than white people, then it would stand the reason that minorities have more on their record, especially if they live in, let's say, certain areas of Springfield or Boston, minority areas, whereas the same people that live in communities like Wellesley and Longmeadow those kids aren't getting charged the same way blacks and minorities are getting charged. And that may be one of the reasons why there's such a disparity in people being sent to prison or minorities uh, per percentage wise than white people. Would you think that might be a reason? I think it may very well be a reason. Uh, many reasons. So why wouldn't we think of maybe stopping that practice? Well, I think the record is important. I don't think it's the only factor, and I think you're 
point about reducing the importance of the record, given what the study says has a lot of valid, you raise a valid issue. But what if Councillor Jubinville, our Houses in, of Corrections and Department of Correction really worked their best of their ability, like they're doing in Hamden County right now, in reducing the return of people back to the life of crime? And that would stop that record from continuing to multiply. Well, not if the police keep arresting black and minorities in a higher percentage than whites. So I get the system that is in place. Right. But the gatekeepers, it seems to me, have to be our judges. They have to be aware. They have to think about this. I think that's my thoughts. Because they're the last ones to save it. They're the last ones to stop it. I see many gatekeepers. I see you as a gatekeeper. I see the police officer on the street as a gatekeeper. I see the probation department, the judges, and then if incarcerated, the correctional staff. I think we all have to be gatekeepers. I agree. But we only, we only do here judges. I, you don't have police come in and put them under, you know, questioning. But um, before I forget, um, D.A. Sullivan, very complimentary, loves you. Attorney Franco, Attorney O'Donnell, and Attorney Wilson had great things to say about you from Hoyoke. Um, so you were asked some questions about the parole board and in your day on the parole board, what did they usually do with second degree lifers? Did they get parole in your day? Some did. Yes. Cause I remember when I first started in this business where if somebody either was given a second degree murder conviction or found second degree. Uh, they were eligible for 15 years and, and a lot of them got it. I think a lot more got it that didn't. But that's not the case today. Um, I know of one case where a fella committed a murder and got a second 40 I want to say 45 years ago. In 15 years, he went out on parole. He's been on parole for 33 years. $80 a month. He has obtained a master's degree from Boston University. Has his own mental health company that he helps people all the time. And he can't get off that parole. He's 67 years old today. And one of the parole board said, well, you know, he's got parole. So in other words, he should be happy with that. I said, well, how long does anybody get off parole? Said, well, yeah, we had one that was very sick person who was dying. We, we let him off parole. So in your day, the people that were on parole for second degree, did, did, did they terminate at a certain point, depending on what the fella did or the woman did over the years? I'm going to be honest with you. No. no? It takes a full uh, board vote. So you need to get four votes out of seven is my memory. I'm pretty sure it's still the case. I mean, it seemed to me that somebody that did something good that long should be a role model for other inmates. You do this, your chance, you can get off parole, but you gotta, you gotta do some stuff. But I, I don't see that. And we haven't had any, any uh, pardons or commutations by Governor Baker. We had 
I think four or five in the last three months of Governor Patrick's term. And in your day and before your day, pardons and commutations were a regular event. Well, they were a regular event for the parole board to hear them. But there's still, I believe, an extraordinary remedy. Well, I looked at statistics in the 1970s at the council here, and the average, I'm, 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 I'm not perfect on this, it was somewhere around three to 400 pardons a year given out. And nobody batted an eye. And most of them were people that had committed a crime when they were in their teens or early 20s. Whatever punishment they got, they did, and they went on to be good citizens for 20, 30, 40 years. And they put in for a pardon. Those are easy, aren't they? I don't, I don't know why we, I said that to the governor here. Well, those are easy. I understand your point of view. I also think in the courts, we uh, have an opportunity to seal records as well. So that provides some relief for people uh, who have change your life or it was a once in a uh, in a lifetime occasion where they entered the criminal justice system. It helps, but you know, what people tell me is the employer sees a sealed record and they assume that it's a very serious crime or a sex crime. So they don't get the job because of it. Um, I, uh, Councilor Ferreira brought up the training by court officers. And I was told by one of the fellows that went through that, that the way he described it to me was a boot camp that was probably more intense training than soldiers got before they stormed the beaches of Normandy. That they were making him, they making these officers do things that had no correlation with what job they were going to do when they got out. And I think when they're that heavy handed, there is a percentage of people that take it seriously on the job, treat people like they were in like they were drill sergeants uh, in the court in the courtroom and i've seen some of that from court officers so when you're on the appeals court maybe you'll have some juice to kind of have somebody look into this i don't think state police officers or local police officers from what i was told are anywhere near trained or yelled at or threatened or whatever they do at this place. Uh, court officer's job is a tough one and, and sometimes you have to be ready for anything. But there's no excuse for not treating people that come into that building courteously. Some of this training I fear stops that. It, it makes these court officers act in a different way. So when you get up there to that lofty area of the appeals court, maybe the chief, get together with the chief and you can do something about this, okay? Uh, the only last thing I have for you is, we've been fighting the war on drugs since 1970, 50, one years. You have any idea what it's cost us in taxpayer funds? I don't. I read it's over a trillion dollars. We're still doing things the same way we did in 1970.
President Biden said he's bringing back the troops from Afghanistan because it's been 20 years. I think 51 years is probably doing something different or stopping or something. It's not working. More drugs in anywhere you can buy in Massachusetts. I think the war on drugs has gone on too long. I don't know if war on drugs is the right way to look at it. I think the fight is is to get people who are addicted back to a, a lifestyle where they're clean and sober. It's the fight. Well, well, the people. I don't, think, I don't think we're going to do that by giving them criminal records, locking them up. I, I don't think that works. My opinion. You look at the collateral damage of this war on drugs. Search and seizure motions. We've just about gutted the Constitution on search and seizure. Most cases that I read are cases involving drugs. Um, they've changed the banking system because of it. Now, when you go to a bank and you ask to take out a thousand dollars and one hundred dollar bills, now maybe I'm just paranoid a little bit, but I think the teller's thinking that I might be doing drugs or making the money on drugs. Crime lab scandal, Boston and Western Mass, all to do with drugs. Maybe up in that appeals court, you can come up with some formula that we can stop putting people in cages because they have addictions. I don't think a lot of, well, I shouldn't say a lot. I know of some judges that do not understand that. They just don't understand it. I understand your point of view. Yeah. I've been to a bunch of drug courts. And uh, in a few of them, I saw the uh, judge. Did you ever do a drug court? No. I saw the judge ask probation officer. So and so, how so and so. Well, had a relapse three weeks ago. A docket. Yeah. Well, I, I was like a guest, so I said something to the judge. I said, why did you put those people in the lockup and what are you going to do with them? And I want to sentence them to three, five days. And because they had a relapse? Yeah. And so they're probably going to lose their job. They have it. They're married and they're renting. They're probably going to lose an apartment. But I said, they did this three and four weeks ago, but they still showed up here today. And the programs they were in didn't throw them out of the program because they understood addiction. But I don't think some of our courts understand that. Anyway, I wish you the best in your new career, your new adventure. I think you'll make a wonderful appeals court judge. I know you're bold. You got to be bold up there, okay? You got to put, you know, reach out and be bold. Do a great job. Thank be you, Councilor Juvenal. My pleasure to vote for you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Um, Councilor Devaney, any questions? It's been said the last shall be first somewhere. They said that, right? <laughs> I, I, I don't have a poker face. You know, I've been smiling since I first saw your name presented. Um, 
I got to tell you, when I look back 23 years, my grandchildren have gone through college. I don't understand it because I'm 35, but that's okay. <laughs> but, um, you know, you did it the old fashioned way. No political contributions, all your relatives on on the bench. I, I couldn't be more proud that, you know, I voted for you years ago. And, you know, there's one other chair of the parole board that I hold in high esteem, and that's Judge Michael Pomerol. You two did things. You changed things. And I saw that in my 21 years. And I want to thank you especially for your commitment to commutations and um, I think of because I've been asking for years for it. People that have, you know, gone through life and they probably stole money off a, you know, off a, a newspaper box when they were 18 years old, and and they're looking for a pattern, and we don't get them. And I ask, and we don't get them. Why? I don't understand it. You know, but I want to thank you for that. And I have to mention Judge Pomerol too, because he has done that. Um, first of all, I, I, I do want to, and I ask everybody to just tell me your, the process of getting here this time. Um, you went before the, the um, Judicial Nominating Commission. 21 are appointed by the governor. The awesome responsibility to choose who they're going to interview or who they're going to reject and who they're going to recommend for a clerk magistrate or for a judgeship. They have authority that we don't have. I only have one person that I vote for. We don't even know how many were interviewed. It might have been just that one. We don't know. So having said that, how many of these 21 lawyers were there to interview you? So there were quite a few because it was during and still is during the pandemic. And so it was a Zoom with two or three TV uh, screens. And there were quite a few uh, counselors. And I don't know that uh, given the time that everybody had enough time, but uh, I, I was asked many questions by many JNC members. And there are how many? I didn't count, but but the, approximate. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna guess, Councillor Devaney. Well, it seemed to me a lot. Uh, I, that, that's okay. No, you know the point is, and it's not directed to you in any way, shape, or form. But the the reason I bring this up because um, there was, in Governor Salucci, God rest his soul. He had a chair of the JNC who got those 21 lawyers together and told them, if you don't go to the hearing, you don't vote on the nominee. We have 10, 11, 12 people never saw the nominee. They didn't show up and they vote. So I just want to vent. So I'm sorry I'm venting for you, but I just want to tell you the position I'm in and I have can't do anything about it, and it's wrong. So anyway, um, you did apply um, to the Superior Court. I did. Tell me about that. So the application process was the same as before, an anonymous application with the last four digits of your Social Security number mm -hmm. as the identifier, and you uh, took out anything that would identify you, uh, whether a name of a law firm or et cetera. Uh, and I uh, was screened through to have an interview with the Judicial Nominating Commission. And I was very uh, happy to have that opportunity. And I did have an interview, um, but I did withdraw my name. Well, who am I to say, but I'd rather see you in the appeals court. Well, thank you. You know, you've made so many decisions. 30 years, this is what I want, 30 years, someone that knows the law, 
the and and the people that sent letters, they've known you 25 years. Um, we've got a letter from who you you were a law clerk for 30 years ago, and he knew even then. He said that you, um, no one I have ever known exceeds and few can equal her intelligence, poise, commitment to public service. As a law clerk, she exhibited superb analytical skills and writing ability, both traits that will serve her well on the appeal court, her work habits, her temperament, her knowledge of law, her outstanding just, I mean, just goes on. Every one of these have known you 20, 25 years, Elizabeth Hanna and, um, uh, Justice Conley, and and they all, you know, say the same thing. Becky Michaels and and Alina Rona and sheriffs, and and they all say the same thing about you. That besides your knowledge, that you have comp, uh, the compassion. You listen. That's very important. You listen to people. And I know you sat with me for four hours, and you're a good listener. <laughs> but anyway. Um, I, I do want to say too that um, I I think it should be noted, and I think it's outstanding that you created the Western Massachusetts Veterans Treatment Court. How important that is! So many of them are suffering, and we don't see the outward signs. And establishing the emerging young adult court of hope—that that's terrific. Tell me about that. And Councilor Devaney, I just want to say that uh, I can't take full credit for any of that. That's a, a team effort uh, by District Attorney Sullivan and District Attorney Galuni and my fellow colleagues in probation. And they're both specialty courts that identify particular needs, whether it be with traumatic brain injuries for our veterans coming back and having mentors that are veterans so that they understand what they're going through and support them, even when times are difficult. And in a very similar, but uh, different approach with the young adults mm -hmm. to try to stop what we can see is happening, which is a lifetime uh, of incarceration and uh, tragedy. Uh, and these are people that just need a lot of support and a lot of counseling and we hope that they'll be able to live a good life. Right. Uh, do you follow up on the veterans court? How successful it is? What is the percentage of the that you know they have been helped and they've gone on with their lives? So it's been incredibly successful. It's uh, being led by uh, Justice Lori McLeod out of the Holyoke District Court. It's a combined effort with the Northwestern District Attorney's Office and the Hamden County District Attorney's Office, which I think is is very unusual. Both DAs are 100% behind it, uh, and they've done extremely well. They have more people in that court in Western Mass than any other in the state, and I credit uh, that team. They have a terrific chief probation officer by the name of Sean McBride, who does mm -hmm. so yeah. much good. That's wonderful. Um, I have um, followed up on the drug court and I've gone to their graduations and I sit in the back and tears come to my eyes because you see these people come in all ages and they speak about how they got there or where they came from. It's amazing. And so, um, you know, people have to know those courts are important. They really, really are, you know. So um, I know you've done a lot of writings and um, a page full here. But one of them that I was um, interested in, quite interested in, because um, Lee Gattenberg called and he couldn't say enough things about you. And as you know, uh, Lee was appointed for an, an expi unexpired term for four months and was replaced. And there's many throughout this Commonwealth that are in shock. And you know, he still sends us um changes in in law and he's just so interested and i know he still advises the parole board god love him but he he couldn't say enough about you and i want you to know so can you i know you wrote 
a lot of, you know, of things with him. Is there something that comes to mind that you is um, memorable to you with Lee? Anytime I get to work with Lee Gartenberg, it's a great honor. He's incredibly just sensitive and brilliant, uh, and there's nothing that he won't do. I mean, he works till all hours. He sends out those glossaries and updates uh, and does trainings and travels all over still. And so we did write uh, one together for an MCLE about the collateral consequences uh, of criminal conduct. Much of what Councillor Jubinville was talking about of all the after effects and harm, whether it's in housing or it's an inability to adopt a child or it's in a, uh, not getting college scholarships and the impediments once somebody uh, has been convicted or incarcerated and Lee's an expert in that field too, working at the jail in Middlesex for so long. Well, I, I, your writing skills will really come in handy up at the appeals court. And I can't be more proud um, that you're going to be serving with um, Judge Green. You know, I, I had the honor of voting for him twice. So it, it really is great to see you up there with him. Now, I'm going to ask you something that kind of left field, okay? Because I kind of I'm full time, so I investigate everything, you know, what's going on in the different courts. So this was a few years back, but this came up before the appeals court. And I'm going to give you a little trial now for your court. Um, there was uh, a woman, no, there was a man walking with two dogs. One dog was on a leash and the German Shepherd, the other dog was a German Shepherd, was loose, just walking with him. This woman was on her lawn with a little dog. The German Shepherd rushed to the little dog and really tore him apart. Now, he survived. She went to a vet and um, he, it took a while, but he did recover and the cost was $4,000. So she went to court and the judge ruled the dog was property. How would you rule when it went to the appeals court? Well, Councillor <laughs> Devaney, I would tell you I would recuse myself because of my love for you got animals. four rescue dogs. I gave you a softball question. <laughs> but as much as I don't like to hear it, the law is clear. Dogs are property. I think that that would be affirmed. Well, the appeals court ruled that the dog was not property. Then. <laughs> They had to pay $4,000, so that was good. Um, <laughs> um, so um, t you had, right off the bat, I mean, in your first few years um, as a, uh, you know, talking about cases, and, and you were involved in two really um, cases that we heard about. Do you want to talk about those? And I'm not sure as a judge or during no, no, when you were um, when you were assistant um, district okay. attorney. So I did have the great honor to second seat uh, two first degree murder trials with now Justice David Ross, who just retired. Uh, and I worked with him in the district attorney's office and it was a murder for hire uh, and very complicated case in which uh, the heirs of the big Y uh, supermarket, uh, one was murdered by an individual at the request uh, of uh, his wife. Uh, and so they were four to six week trials in the Superior Court. And I uh, had the great honor to assist uh, Judge Ross, then Prosecutor Ross in those cases. Uh, nobody has his talent or work yeah. ethic. Well. What I have seen in is, as you as a judge, the compassion you have shown, especially for people who have been driving under the influence, and you've changed their lives. Do you, do you want to talk about any of them or one of them, about how you, um, how you were successful and that person um, was exonerated at the end of the after they looked into all of the case. And so uh, I, I would say in the treatment court, Councillor Devaney, uh, we have one individual who's close to graduation and 
uh, in the beginning when uh, the plea was occurring. Um, she couldn't make it through the basic questions in the colloquy asking if she had had anything to drink in the last 24 hours. And she had to come back and to me, it was an indicator that she needed a lot of help and uh, she's been sober now for 18 months and she's been an unbelievable member of our treatment court. And I'm really proud. The one I was thinking of uh, probably mispronounced it Zeiniger. Thank you. So that was a case in which it, I hope it will give me a, a, a perspective if I'm fortunate enough to be on the appeals court. And I was in the district court and it had to do with uh, business records and whether or not they were admissible. And I think that perspective of having the jurors looking at you and the attorneys wanting for you to make an instant ruling of whether something should be admissible and or whether it, it does not meet the business uh, rule requirements, exceptions to the hearsay rule um, is something that I'm very proud of. Uh, and I did uh, make a finding and I did admit those records. Uh, they were uh, Office of Alcohol Testing Records and that was upheld by the Supreme Judicial Court. And uh, it's something that when I look back, tells me about the great challenge of being in the trial court and how you have to just make decisions with the best of your abilities and continue to work on education. Now, as a judge, you've had to make, you have to, you had to struggle sometimes to make a decision. It has to be difficult. I know there's a lot, but is there one that comes to mind that it was one of the hardest that you ever had before you to decide? One of the hardest cases for me as a district court judge is vehicular homicide. The standard is negligence. So it's not uh, something where somebody necessarily intended the consequences. They failed to use ordinary care and it resulted in the death. And everyone in that room wants the victim back alive, including the person who was behind the wheel. So I had a case uh, not that far ago, and even during COVID times, that was a plea. And it's just tragic. 21 years old, is on the back uh, of a, uh, the hood of a car driving and the uh, friend was under the influence uh, and he hit the brakes and this young man uh, hit his head and that resulted in his eventual death. And determining what justice is, I listened to the mother and father and to the sister and the brother of the victim forgave and supported this defendant and wanted a sentence to be imposed that was different than the prosecutor's sentence. And it's a struggle, but I went along with what the mother and father thought was justice for their child and what they thought that he would want for the friend, well, but it was hard. That's why I, I, I know on the appeals court, you'll be able to make those quick decisions. You've had to do it all these years. And and I, I really, everything about you, your age, your life experience, everything you bring to the bench is what I look for. Now I'm going to mention, and I did talk about it when we met, the Wells Acre, the Fells Acre case. Okay. I was involved in this, so I know. Uh, my husband, a friend of ours, my husband was a firefighter, his firefighter friend, talk with me because it might have come up before the governor's council. If the governor voted, yes, it would come before us. So I had got deeply into this and I thought I knew everything until our friend, very close friend, talked with me. He had me in tears. This four-year-old little girl went to that daycare. And 
she started crying. She didn't want to go, and she was really very upset. And a four-year-old can't always express why they're upset. And she would come home with someone else's panties. Maybe her panties would be inside out. And then there was blood in her pants. They brought her to the doctor. She went to the hospital. I don't want to get into all the details. But it was definite abuse. And you know what's sad? She's a beautiful girl. She's a grown-up woman. And she's never had a relationship with anyone. She's broken up a couple of times when she's been engaged. People think children get over sexual trauma. Never, never. And so he said to me, Marilyn, please don't vote yes. Don't let Tukey out. And I have no evidence, but everything that I looked for and I read everything in my heart, I believe his mother and his sister were innocent. And I believe it. I don't think they knew because they had another little room that, that he could bring them in. And I think of that and I think what decisions a judge has to make, really, you know? And so he finished his term. I think he only had a year or something, wasn't it? But I'll tell you, that made such an impression on me to realize you have the evidence that's brought before you and you have to determine who's truthful and who isn't and whose lives have been affected. And it's still upsetting to me to talk about her. And so um, she's a forensic specialist now. It's beautiful, beautiful girl inside and out. So here we are, but I, I have to tell you, um, I couldn't be more pleased and I think the governor should get a message that you should be a role model. I don't expect everyone to be of the caliber that you are, but let's let's look for them. Let's look for the age, not someone 40. I don't want someone 30 years or 40 years as a clerk magistrate. And um, I, I just uh, I just know you'll be great. And I know that um, they'll be welcoming you. And I'm very proud of the people that, that I did vote on that especially um, Judge Green, um, he's just the best. But it is a diverse group this time. It really is diverse. So, I mean, when I think of your, I think what you bring to the bench, what we don't see is all your years, 10 years on the parole board and what you saw. And I saw it all. I saw Sinelli, three 15 year life sentences, okay? And I talked to the chair. I'll have to admit I didn't vote for him, okay? The, and I talked to him the day after that he killed the officer. And you know, we talk about, and it's sad, we have some, black, we have some bad officers, but they're the minority of, of the hundreds and thousands that we have. We don't talk about the police officers that are killed every day. And I've gone to those funerals. And I went to that funeral in Woburn and and you know i asked the the chair of the parole board what was the protocol when he was let go and um i said did he see his parole did he see his parole office uh, probation officer w what did you do oh yes he had a job with his uncle and he paid rent to him and we gave him a plumbing uh job he was learning and all of this none of the above None of it. So for me, this has been an education because now I'm looking, now I'm looking, what are they doing on the Pro Bowl? What are they expecting when they let these people out? So it is important. And um, just recently, I was very pleased that they refused this young woman who sexually assaulted children, two-year-olds, and, and burnt them with cigarettes all over the body and all these horrible things. And they they didn't parole her, but unfortunately they got that new rule one day, one week off a week, so she got off last month. So nothing is ever perfect, but uh, you know I, I just think 
your experience there in in helping people to reentry in society. That's so important. So you saw all of that. So you bring a different perspective than the usual person we see going for a judge. Um, you know, I, I I just I keep on saying Mike Palmer because I put you two in the same box because he had all these programs that were mandated to you know for high school and and uh, you know anger management and all that. You did a lot of those things too. So um, I, I'm just so pleased. I could talk about other cases, but I know this has been a long day for you, and um, you know you've heard questions from everyone else, and I'm last. But um, I'm just so pleased. I mean, when I think of 23 years and um and i'm not just saying that you look great i, I you know i don't know in the, you know you've done the right things for the years but i know the challenge on the appeals court and you have to think on your feet fast and you'll do it you have been doing it and um I, i'm all i can say is that I'll, I'll be very happy to be voting for you and this was a good appointment Please, God, let the governor have more. <laughs> <You know? laughs> thank so, you, Councillor. Thank Dimitri. you so much for applying and and that. But you got to the right court. The thank you. Spirit court wouldn't have been for you. <laughs> thank. You. Well, actually, I'm last, and um, I just want to go over a couple things that I, you know, I, Councillor Devaney has been complaining about the fact that. An assistant clerk who was designated as acting clerk did not get a um, interview. But the way that the system works, the first part of the review of the applications is totally blind. So the JNC would not have known that this was the acting clerk, would not have known anything. Um, and would have been looking at a blind um, application. So the fact she didn't get, or he didn't get an interview was based upon the fact that the part of the application that they did review did not bode as well as the other ones who did get an interview and the ones that they would have seen the second part where they would have known that that person was an assistant clerk. And that's the way it should be. It should be a blind questionnaire because that way it's not a popularity contest. It's there on the merits. Um, so I thank you for bringing that up as far as the, the process. Now, is it? true that the first day that you were a judge, you forgot your robe? Yes. It was, but I didn't have a robe quite yet because the bar association was giving me a robe and my swearing in was later, but there was a judge out in Chicopee who was kind enough to let me borrow one. Reminded me about that. Any chance she gets, that was me. Can you hear me? I can, it was you, <laughs> Judge Hurley, and you gave me a robe and gave me lots of advice too. Well, I guess you must have been good following it because here you are today, and I usually don't make predictions about what's going to happen um, next week when we vote, but with the number of counselors who have said that they're going to support you and vote for you, I'm going to make a prediction that you're going to go to the appeals court. Very honored. And it's very well deserved. Um, and. Um, I think you're going to do a great job. Um, I'm mad at you for deserting the district court. But I also know that you like a challenge. And um, I'm, I guess, the same kind of person you are because 
I've changed jobs a lot too. Uh, and I think you're going to do a great job. Um, and the fact that the fact that you have adopted and rescued so many dogs over the years, um, and my great observation of you is that your best quality is your heart and your kindness and your care and concern about other people. And that's why you did a great job on the parole board. That's why you did a great job as a district court judge and then the regional administrative judge and the person that's taken on so many creative jobs in terms of creating new types of courts to give people who come into the justice system a chance to basically remake themselves and have a chance at being great citizens. So it will be my honor next week to put your name in a nomination for consideration and vote by the council. And I predict you're gonna have a unanimous vote and I predict that you are going to do a great job on the appeals court. So it's been my honor and pleasure to be your governor's counselor, your friend, and your cohort on the uh, district court. Uh, you're a great person and you're going to make a great judge. So thank you. And That's really Thank you for everything. Um, I hope you're going to buy all the people that you brought uh, down with you some lunch because it's one o'clock and I'm declaring this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to uh, go offline now. Thank you, everybody.